Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. Remember, remember, the 5th of November, gunpowder, treason, and plot. I see no reason why gunpowder, treason, should ever be forgot. Every year, people across the United Kingdom light fireworks and bonfires to commemorate the events of November 5th, 1605. Guy Fox Knight celebrates the capture of Fox, who was apprehended under the British Houses of Parliament with 36 barrels of gunpowder, fuses, and matches, planning to blow up King James I and his entire Parliament. The plan was to assassinate the Protestant king and replace him with a Catholic princess. The failed plot would shape the religious course of British North America as one of Protestantism instead of Catholicism. Guy Fawkes' influence on pop culture continues to this day. A mask, based on his face, has become a symbol of the hacker collective Anonymous and is often worn by present-day street protesters around the world. The person that history and popular consciousness tends to remember with the gunpowder plot is, of course, Guy Fawkes. Absolutely. So when we commemorate Bonfire Night, we think about Guy Fawkes and you can buy his mask. But he's actually not even the top plotter. And um, there are 13 members of the plot. About four or five are really key members. And Guy Fawkes is probably about the third or fourth in that list. Why was it difficult to be a Catholic in England in the early 1600s? Let's get into the details then of this religious insurgency by Catholics in this period and try to understand why this feeling sprang up at the time. By 1605, it had actually been illegal to worship as a Catholic in England for nearly 50 years. So we always think about Elizabeth I for her sort of tolerance and the successes of her reign. But actually, although her religious settlement that she makes following the reign of her Catholic sister Mary is intended to be sort of a middle road to try and please many people, it really doesn't please the Catholics because it makes it illegal to be a Catholic in England. And it's a legal requirement that you have to attend the Protestant parish church every Sunday. So it's really, really difficult to be a Catholic in Elizabeth's England and then in James's England because you can't worship openly. You have to go to the Protestant parish church. So actually, Catholics really develop a number of strategies to cope. So some will go to the Protestant church and they're known as church papists. And actually, they have some strategies to try and avoid this heretical service as they see it. So we have accounts of Catholics loudly saying their rosary when the Protestant service is going on or getting up and walking at the back of the church with their hands over their ears so they can't hear. Because it's not really the path of least resistance, because as far as the Catholic Church is concerned, to attend a heretical service is to damn your soul. Another option for Catholics is to be a recusant, where you refuse to attend church. But actually, you can face some very severe punishments for this. You'll be fined for recusancy, and they're very high fines. So actually, most Catholics can't afford to be recusants for too long. So was there someone taking a register at church services on Sundays to check that the local people were attending? Yes, there is. I mean, the church wardens are supposed to report on who comes to church and who doesn't come to church. And so it sort of depends on the area. If it's quite a Catholic area, you may find that you're not being reported for recusancy because actually the church wardens are quite Catholic themselves. But it really depends. A lot of people are, a lot of great families are absolutely bankrupted by these fines. So this is spying and mass surveillance of the general populace on a mass scale. And that's no pun, by the way. I mean, it's really an attempt to bring people into the Church of England by sort of default, if you like. You may not get the parents, but if you make all the children come to church all through their lives, they'll probably grow up Protestant. And that's what the Elizabethan authorities are hoping for. So what punishments could a Catholic face? So you have the fines for recusancy. If you're a Catholic priest and you're caught, you will be executed and they're normally hanged, drawn and quartered. So, you know, really unpleasant. If you're caught helping a priest, you can be imprisoned and also executed. And there are also sort of other penalties. Famously, there's Margaret Clitheroe, who is the wife of a butcher from York. I'm actually the city that Guy Fawkes comes from. And she is sentenced to be pressed to death under stones because she won't enter a plea of whether or not she's harboring Catholic priests. So some of the treatment meted out to Catholics in the Elizabethan period can be very, very brutal. Where do the roots of this religious insurgency by Catholics against the Protestant religion come from? 
I think it's to some extent bred out of sort of hopelessness. They're hoping that if they change the government, that maybe they'll get a better result. You know, they're hoping for a Catholic government or at least someone who is prepared to allow them to worship. But I suppose my broader question was more about where this sort of stems from historically. Does this go back to Henry VIII's troubles with the Pope and this sort of thing? It goes back to Henry VIII and his attempt to annul his marriage to Catherine of Aragon and marry Anne Boleyn. And of course, Catherine of Aragon doesn't go quietly. The Pope will not grant an annulment. And eventually, Henry breaks the English church away from the Church of Rome, so from the Pope, and declares himself supreme head of the church. And Henry's church is by no means Protestant, but he does make some changes to the church that are quite radical. But he continues to burn Protestants as heretics right up to the end of his reign, although he also hangs Catholics as traitors. So, you know, he's fairly fair in his treatment of people who are religious. Or at least consistent. He is quite consistent, yes. He actually does burn one Catholic as a heretic, but generally he hangs them. The Protestant Reformation really gets going in the reign of his son, Edward VI. And this is where you have to strip out all the church furniture and you have a new book of common prayer, which is a Protestant service book. Edward dies after six years and Mary, his half-sister, becomes queen and she returns England to the Church of Rome. So it becomes a Catholic country again. So Elizabeth I, her half-sister, inherits a Catholic country when she becomes queen in 1558, but she very quickly imposes her Protestant religious settlement. And it's not as staunchly Protestant as in her brother's reign. It is a bit of a middle way. And actually, she doesn't please everyone. She doesn't please the Puritans in her government, for example, who are very Calvinist and want a very sort of plain church. But it certainly doesn't please the Catholics. And Elizabeth is not a Catholic at all. And increasingly during her reign, Catholicism becomes associated with treason. So it becomes very, very difficult to be a Catholic in Elizabeth's reign. So over the space of several decades, England is really, it's in crisis over its religious identity, all because of Henry VIII and him wanting to get an annulment and to split from Catherine of Aragon, his first wife. Yeah, I mean, it's basically that. It's, I mean, the whole of Europe is undergoing religious turmoil at this point because Protestantism develops out of the writings of Martin Luther early in the 16th century. So Germany, for example, becomes very Protestant. But in France in the 16th century, we have the wars of religion where Protestants are fighting Catholics. And I mean, it's essentially a civil war. So it's not really just an English thing. What makes it unusual in England is that it's Catholics who are the persecuted group rather than Protestants. But like a war, there's two sides and they're constantly going at each other, recovering grounds that was previously lost and this sort of thing. It's kind of a war of attrition, isn't it? It is. And what actually, um, I mean, Elizabethan literature, what they clearly find very, very sinister about Catholics is you can't actually tell if someone's a Catholic because people sort of suddenly reveal themselves. I mean, a really good example is Sir Thomas Stanley, who is Guy Fawkes's commander in the Spanish Catholic army in the Netherlands. And he's actually a really important English commander for years and years and years. And um, Robert Dudley, the Queen's favourite, actually says, you know, he's worth his weight in pearl. He's such a good commander. And then one day he just suddenly announces that he's a Catholic and takes his, his soldiers over to the Spanish. So Catholics are seen as very, very sinister to Elizabethans. They become sort of everybody's favourite bogeyman, if you like. People are genuinely quite scared of Catholics and they are seen as quite sort of insidious duplicitous potentially as well. That's right, yes. Yeah. So James I, obviously the new king, had only recently come to the throne. James I of England, James VI of Scotland. How did James's accession to the throne of England affect Catholics? Catholics were very, very hopeful about James. James was raised as a Protestant in Scotland, but he was the son of two Catholic parents. So he was the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, and her Catholic second husband, Henry Lord Darnley. So there were sort of hopes that, although he hadn't been raised by his parents, this Catholicism would sort of have rubbed off on him. And James was determined to inherit the English throne. And it was by no means a certainty because Elizabeth didn't have an obvious successor. And so essentially, he would tell Englishmen who came to him really what they wanted to hear to try and get them to support him. So when Thomas Percy heads north to go and meet with James before his accession, and he goes with messages from his cousin, Yell of Northumberland, James very much gives Thomas Percy the impression that he's going to be tolerant of Catholicism, you know, maybe even favour it. So Thomas Percy 
really has a crushing blow when it's quickly realized that actually James has no intentions of returning to Catholicism or even of tolerating it. And actually toleration itself is a really difficult concept in the 16th and 17th centuries. It's not how we would use the word today. So when people call out for tolerance, they almost always only do it when they're a minority. And the reason for that is because actually, I mean, if, if there's only one correct way to worship God, which these different groups fervently believe there is, then how can you be tolerant? Because of course, you have a God-given requirement to convert people to the true faith. So people will call for tolerance in the period, but actually really, they don't exactly mean it. They want to be dominant. They want to be the religion that is in charge. What did the plotters hope to achieve then with the gunpowder plot? The plotters are hoping to entirely remove the Protestant government. They want to place James's daughter, Princess Elizabeth, who is a child, on the throne, presumably to marry her off to a good Catholic prince. And they then want to create a Catholic government to rule through her. So she'll effectively be a puppet queen. So they are intending to change the state religion by wiping out the government. So they want England to be a Catholic country. They're not looking for toleration or tolerance. They're looking for state Catholicism. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride. 